Good morning, church family. Is it good to be the house of the Lord this morning? Always, Always and amen. Well, thank you all for being in here. I don't know if it's true for you, but for me, I'm having a wonderful time this morning. We had a great time in our Sunday school uh, with our church family in there, a small portion of our church family, and then gathering in here together with all of you is a joy to my soul, singing with you, observing a baptism, praying together, giving together, serving together, studying God's word together. We are in a very blessed church family, amen? Amen, amen and amen. We are open in our Bibles this morning to Proverbs chapter three. Proverbs chapter three. We are in verses five through eight. This morning, what I want to talk to you about is trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Trusting in the Lord with all your heart. This is a very familiar set of verses for all of us. In fact, this may be one of the first passages that you ever memorize, and it's a wonderful passage to memorize, and it's an even better passage to live by. When we read this passage, there's a very clear command that's given. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. From that command, I, I think that there are two essential understandings that are implied. There are two essential understandings that are implied in that command. And if you and I are to trust in the Lord with all our heart, we have to have those understandings. Again, they're essential. We have to have these particular understandings to live a life of honoring God by trusting in him. Let me draw this together and point those two understandings out to you right here at the outset. I don't want to conceal anything. I want these truths right here to be evident in front of us, and then I want you to see those come straight from the passage, straight from God's word. To trust in the Lord with all your heart, you must first have a proper view of your own condition, and second, of the nature of God. To trust in the Lord with all your heart, you must have a proper view of your own condition and of the nature of God. If you have a proper view of yourself, you will not trust your own heart. And if you have a proper view of the nature of God, you will do everything you possibly can to trust him and him alone. So by virtue of those truths, we come to understand that when we trust ourselves rather than God, we have a failing false view of our own condition. And we have a blasphemous view and understanding of the nature of God. Such is true when we trust in our own selves. But this morning, we have this hopeful, inviting passage where we are commanded and brought in to trust in the Lord with all our heart and leaning not on our own understanding. We acknowledge him in all of our ways and we have this blessed promise and he will make straight our paths. God will take care of everything for us. You see these two essential understandings in verse five through seven. That's what I want to point out for you from those verses, those two essential understandings. And then in verse eight, you see the result of trusting in the Lord, the result of trusting in the Lord. The first understanding is going to come right here at the outset. Let me go ahead and announce it and then begin to explain from God's word. To trust in the Lord with all your heart you must have a proper view of your own condition. You must have a proper view of your own condition. Look at how Solomon, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in God's inerrant word, states it. Verse five, trust in the Lord 
with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Let's grab a portion of verse seven. First part where he says, be not wise in your own eyes. You see, there is something implied by Solomon's authoritative command to us to feign trust in ourselves, to avoid it, to render rather our trust fully in God, to avoid leaning on our own understanding, to do what is necessary to not see our own selves as wise. What is the implication? The implication is that there is something about us that is untrustworthy. There is something about us that will lead us to the incorrect understanding. And there is something about us that is inherently unwise. So we would be wise to understand that about our own condition. You see, even people who are saved, who have been born again, who are forgiven of their sins, this is the truth. We are saved from the penalty of sins by putting our faith in Jesus. We are saved from the penalty of our sins. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. Therefore, we are not held responsible for those sins any longer because they've been paid for. We are freed from the penalty of our sins. We are still being set free from the power of sin, though. We are still being set free from the power of sin. This is, this is what the Bible calls sanctification. It is the progressive work of God whereby he is removing us from sin and removing sin from us and he is drawing us closer to himself and making us more like himself. But what is still true of us? What is still true of us is that though we are saved from the penalty of sin, our feelings, our inclinations, our thoughts, our motivations, our emotions are all affected by the presence of sin and the power of sin. All of us, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our inclinations, our motivations, whether you like it or not, in truth, they are all affected by the power and the presence of sin. We are not trustworthy in our own thoughts. Our emotions will lead us astray. Isn't this an excuse that we use at times? Please forgive me, I said that in emotion. I was overcome by the moment. I don't know what overcame me. And we, we recognize these things about ourselves and we use them as a cop-out. But the reality is that there is no part of us that is unaffected by sin. In Genesis chapter six, before God himself floods the earth and destroys all of humanity, it says this in verse five that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Has the nature of mankind changed since the flood? You realize it was still human beings that got on the boat and then got off the boat. The only thing that qualified Noah and his family to get on that boat was number one, the grace of God. It was not a change in the nature of man. And it was the faith of Noah, not the faith of his family. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verse three, Solomon, the writer of Proverbs, the majority of it, that is, this is his observation of man. He says, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live. This is Solomon's observation of all mankind. In fact, even in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine, we read that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. David himself, under the inspiration of the Spirit, in Psalm 51, verse five, he speaks of his own condition, and he says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And David was not conceived in adultery, by the way. He's not speaking about the manner of his conception. He is speaking about the nature of his condition. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. All of these men and the Lord himself understood and understand the nature of our condition. There is something about our hearts that are sinful and desperately sick and untrustworthy and undependable. Even the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20 says this. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. God knows the nature of our condition And this is what God has inspired to be written for us to not trust ourselves. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not, do not lean on your own understanding. So we are told by way of implication that there is something untrustworthy and undependable about our thoughts and our understandings and our reasonings. There is something also implied here about the leadership of the Lord and about the nature of God himself. The second understanding that is essential for us to have if we're gonna trust in the Lord with all our heart, not just knowing our own condition, that we are sinful. But the second is this, to trust in the Lord with all your heart, you must have a proper view of the nature of God. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Fear the Lord. There is something about God that is by nature trustworthy and dependable and right and righteous and good and wise. In fact, that is his nature. There are certain things that we must understand about the nature of God if we are to trust him with all our heart. The first thing we have to do is we have to understand that God is sovereign. That God is in control of all things. This is why I not only can trust him, but must trust him. Isaiah chapter 46, verse nine through 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. You see God's claim there? His claim is that he declares the end From when? From the beginning. Before things even start, God has determined the outcome. Why would I not trust him? You see, there's got to be more that is essential to the nature of God 
for me to trust in is not just that God is sovereign, because what if God was not good? See, if God is sovereign, but he is not good, I wouldn't want to trust him. But the fact is, is that not only is God sovereign over all things, but that God is good. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, the apostle John says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. There's nothing evil in God. There's nothing malevolent in God. There is nothing untrustworthy. There is nothing crooked. There is nothing out of place. God is not like us. And we are not like God. And this is why we are not trustworthy, but God is trustworthy. He is sovereign and he is good. But that's not all. Not only is God sovereign and good, but God is perfectly wise. You see, God has declared the end from the beginning. And God has declared all of the things that happen in between, not in randomness, not as a happenstance, not as a reaction, but God has declared all things according to his perfect wisdom. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Everything that God does, he does in a perfect, wise order. He's sovereign, he's good, he's wise. Can I tell you this? God has determined to show and act in love toward you. God has determined to show and act in love toward you. God is not going to lead you astray. God is not going to lead you into something to harm you. There's no need to draw back your hand from taking his. There's no need to recoil. There's no need when the good shepherd calls your name to say, I don't know. God has determined to act in love toward you. The one who is sovereign over all the one in whom there is no darkness at all, the one who acts in perfect wisdom, he has set his affections upon you. How do we know this? We know this not only because God has told us, but because God has proven it to us. Romans chapter five, verse eight but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you wanna know how much God loves you, if you wanna know if God has determined to act in love towards you, you need look no further than Jesus. God in his love has graciously given his son to live and to die on your and my behalf. If God has given his son for us, why would he ever lead us astray? Do you think God would send his son Jesus to die for you just to get you in his grasp and lead you astray? The answer to that is a resounding no. God has sent the good shepherd to die for his sheep so that we would all be one flock under his leadership and so that he could lead us into green pastures and to still waters and to restore our soul. God is sovereign, God is good, God is wise, and God has determined to act in love towards his people. This is why we so loudly Resound with our amens at Romans 8, 28. 
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things in our lives, God is working them together for good. And while we cannot trust our own thoughts and inclinations and emotions and motivations and feelings and desires, there is nothing untrustworthy in God. And yet there is everything that is trustworthy about him. Everything about him is trustworthy. So if we're gonna trust in the Lord with all our heart, we have to come to understand and accept the nature of our own condition. My emotions and inclinations and desires are faulty and affected by sin. And this is the need that I have every moment of the power of the Holy Spirit within me to lead me away from sinful desire and to lead me in paths of righteousness. And the God who made all things and controls all things also loves me. And he has not only offered, he has commanded the way in which we should go. It is wise, it is good, and it will be rewarded as well. Listen to how it works out. Look again, Proverbs chapter three, verse five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. and Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Have, have God and his will and his purpose and his law in your mind during everything of life. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. God will straighten out the crookedness of life. We, we, we say things like, oh, what a tangled web we weave. Because we have a way of getting ourselves into situations that feel like a twisted knot or a bird's nest in a fisherman's reel. So how do we get this untangled? How do we fix this? And most fishermen, when they see that bird's nest in the reel, We'll end up just taking a knife or a pair of scissors and just cut everything, throw it away, and start over. People do this with their life, too. Say, well, I'm just gonna go somewhere new, just gonna start over, gonna find somebody new, I'm gonna start over, I'm just gonna cut all ties. How did we get ourselves in these kinds of positions to begin with? We didn't trust in the Lord with all our heart. No, we leaned on our own understanding. In whatever ways we acted, we did not acknowledge him. And so our paths have become crooked. But no, the Lord calls us to something else. Just quit trusting your heart and your emotions and your desires. Quit trusting your inclinations and your motivations. Call them all into question. Don't go with your gut. Walk according to God's word. Trust in him. He's controlling all things. He is good. He is wise. And what will happen when you do trust him? God will take the crookedness of life and he'll straighten it out. He will make you walk in an upright, righteous, godly manner. God will straighten out the ways of life. See, when your faith is fully invested in the Lord and you walk in obedience to his will, he makes straight your paths. That is, you don't have to concern yourself with securing certain outcomes, nor do you have to be anxious about what will happen. Is this not what troubles us most often? 
We think that we have to finagle and manipulate and figure out and reason and lose sleep and think it through until we are bleeding from our eyes and ears. We'll figure it out and we will secure the outcome based on our own thoughts and our own reasonings. But God tells us that if we'll just trust in him, with all our heart, we don't have to worry. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to secure the right outcomes. He will. He will take care of it. If we will obey God in the day to day, he will take care of our tomorrows. Seek first, Matthew 6, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things All the things you need in life, God will add them to you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Trust in the Lord. Don't trust in your reasoning. Trust in his command. Why is this? We understand our condition and we understand the nature of God. One of the things that we will come to conclude is this. Our reasoning will never arrive at the wisdom of God because in the end, in the final assessment, man is not God. Man is not God. Man never will be God. Man is affected in every way by sin. But even if we were not, hear me, we are affected in every way by sin, but even if we were not, man is not God. In the garden was Adam affected by sin. Was his intellect, was his reasoning, before he sinned, was he affected by sin? No, he was not. But what did Adam fail to do? He failed to trust in the Lord. Instead, he listened to a lie and he doubted God. And Satan said, did God really say that? Should you really trust him, Adam? Should you really trust him, Eve? You see, we on this side of Adam's sin, we are conceived in iniquity. There's never a moment in our life that we are not affected by the presence and the power of sin. But even in the garden before sin existed in man, the conclusion is that man is not God. And that if man depends on his reasoning, even in a sinless state, man will fail and fall. None of us are in a sinless state. And even that didn't help Adam. How much more so us now, who have been affected thousands of years of the presence of sin in our ancestors and thousands of moments and days in our own lives affected by sin. Though the Lord says this of himself, Isaiah 55, verse six through nine, he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Our reasoning, our thinking will never arrive at the wisdom of God. 
The wisdom of God in truth is given to us by God himself when we walk according to his commands and when we walk according to his word. I wanna tell you that the premier example of this is found in how man pursues God. In the faulty reasoning of man, what has mankind declared and assumed is the way to get to God? Man has assumed the way to get to God is through moral living, through living righteously, through being glorious and doing mighty things. Even our ancestors tried to build a tower to the heavens. And, and, and man has thought, if I'm, just, if I'm just good enough, if I try hard enough, and you say, oh, well, that's not us. It, it, it definitely is us when we depend on our own, own understandings. When we think that I am here today and I am blessed because I am walking the right path and I'm doing the good thing and I'm doing the right thing, that is not why you're blessed. That is not why God looks upon you in favor. In the wisdom of God, God has determined to be gracious to us, to give us that which we do not deserve. We are blessed because God has chosen to bless us. We are here because God in his grace has chosen to give life to us, not because we walk the narrow path, not because we live a righteous life, and no person by their own actions has ever rendered themselves sinless in the eyes of God. This is mankind's thoughts. But in the wisdom of God, no human being could ever come to the conclusion of God's design. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart imagined, this is what God has planned. And what God has planned and God has accomplished is not that man would get to God by ascending to him through a righteous life, but that God would come to man and that God would put on flesh and he would dwell among us. He would live according to the law of God and then he would give his life up and die for us, absorbing the penalty for all of our sins, all the times we did not trust in the Lord, that Adam would not come to God but that God would come to Adam. And Jesus conquers death by experiencing it, by rising from the dead. And how are people made right with God? People, again, they're made right with God by faith. You know what another word for faith is? Trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't think that you can get to God and be made right with him because you're gonna live right and you're gonna clean up your act. No. God in his sovereign, good wisdom and love towards you has already come. And he's already died for your sins. He's already been raised from the dead. And if you will believe in him, he will make straight all your paths. He'll give you forgiveness and he'll put you on that path that leads to everlasting life. This is the promise that God has made us in his word. It was the way when Solomon wrote it, it's the way still even today. Look at his exhortation to us in verse seven. He says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. This is the nature of what it means to be 
truly a wise person is to not think that you're wise. It is to not trust in yourself. It is to fear the Lord, that is to respect him, have a profound reverence for him in all of life and turn away from evil. Just obey his word. Just do the next right thing according to God's word. And what is the result of trusting in the Lord? You see it in verse eight. He says, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. For people who are marred with the consequences and the presence and the power of sin in our bodies, what do we need? We need healing in our flesh. For people whose souls were lost, irreparably damaged by sin, what does God do for the innermost part of a person who trusts in him? He says it will be refreshment to your bones. God will bring peace and healing to your soul through trust. That is faith. I hope we see this. Faith in this passage is the true medicine of God. Trusting in God with all our heart will heal what ails us. It will overcome the power of sin. It will overcome the effects of sin in our life. It'll heal the soul. It will straighten the paths of life. It will overcome the corruption of our flesh and it will bring about peace in life. But how do we come to that conclusion? We come to that conclusion first by understanding our own condition. That there is no part of me that has been unaffected by sin my emotions, my thoughts, my inclinations, my desires, my motivations. But God in his grace has chosen to act in love towards me. He controls the end from the beginning. He determines the outcome and he can make straight all the paths of life if I'll just do what he has commanded me to do every single day. Well, what's gonna happen tomorrow? And what's gonna happen in this situation? And what's, what's gonna happen if, if they do this or if this happens in my life? You don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is honor God right now in this moment and then in the next and all that follow it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and it will be refreshment to your bones. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, Lord, we recognize that these Lord, that these truths seem to be quite evident to us. But Lord, we struggle in the moment to act according to them. We tend to trust ourselves and doubt you. We tend to think we know a better way rather than depending on you. And rather than walking by faith, we walk by sight. But Lord, help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to be people who trust you with every fiber of our being, that we would have faith fully invested. And in this way, Lord, you will bring healing to our flesh and you will bring refreshment to the deepest parts of our person. Lord, help us, we pray, in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.